Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Rosemary Clooney was a singer and an actress. She had a rough start to life, and even with her fame, she still suffered. However, she clawed her way back from the darkness she was in. What made Rosemary Clooney to become an erratic woman? George Clooney, or Georgie as Rosemary called him, said, I don't take painkillers because we've had members of our family who have become very fond of painkillers over the years. George is Rosemary's nephew, who moved in with her when he was 19. The strapping young man would eventually become a reputable actor, and when work dried up for Rosemary, he pulled some strings to help get work on TV. Rosemary liked some of the said work. Others say she just coasted through for the sake of work, and Rosemary did care about work. So, why are we talking about what George said? Don't worry, pay attention to it. It'll make even more sense when we get into it later. You only have to stick with us. We also want you to know that, like the Fonda family, the Cloonies are also Hollywood royalty. Even if Rosemary's early life didn't even point to the glory, that would eventually be hers. Rosemary was a powerful singer, and she had the bearing of a star ever since she was a child. Her brother Nick claimed she could sing before she could talk. Also, the star had been dazzling on stage since she was three, with her earliest performance being at Russell House, a downtown movie theatre in her native Maysville, Kentucky. The song she sang then was, When Your Hair Has Turned to Silver, I Will Love You Just the Same. Also, the actress had entertainers on both sides of the family. Her father's sister, Olivette, was a band leader, and Anne Gilfoyle, her mother's younger sister, sang at the clubs. With those two's influence on her, her choosing to sing would always happen. Plus, those who watched a performance in her high school production of Snow White knew she was a brilliant actress. Despite a costume mishap on stage, she remained in character, delivering her lines with great skill. She would also have a reputation as a comedian in school. She had the it, but eventually she lost the it, and her decent was pretty ugly. The actress went from struggling to balance work and family to having full time for her children. Hollywood fame and her marriage consumed her, and she had to pick up the pieces, but she wasn't alone. She had her children, and she let them know what they meant to her. The singer-turned-actress would try out new recipes for her kids, and her warm personality drew in other children who had broken homes. Rosemary would know all about broken homes, since she came from one herself. Perhaps because of her background, the actress found it difficult to make the right choice in men until after multiple failed attempts. Her choices hurt her, and they almost ruined her. But all through her experience, the actress was keen to survive. She held on for dear life and slowly built back what she had lost. It was tough, but Rosemary, she could be tougher. In fact, it was her toughness that prevented her from finding help when she should have. So, what is her story? We have teased it. Now let us tell it. Forget her sweet tunes, not much about Rosemary's life had the warmth her song had. She was born to Andrew Joseph and Marie Frances Clooney in Maysville, Kentucky. The sexy singer and actress was the eldest child, and it put heavy responsibilities on her. She had to look after her siblings, with her father being addicted to booze, and her mum chasing her saleswoman career. While it isn't unconfirmed, maybe her parents' negligence was responsible for the death of Andy, one of the singer's siblings, when they were kids. Andy drowned in a swimming accident, and the tragedy affected Rosemary's mind, even if it wasn't apparent at the time. Eventually her parents divorced, and her mum took her sibling Nick as she travelled to California, leaving Rosemary and her sister Betty with their dad. But the problem was Andrew was so far gone in his addiction to alcohol that he went in and out of jail because of his drinking problem. Their mother moved on and married another man, giving birth to their half-sister Gail Stone. But Rosemary and Betty couldn't move on and didn't get to be teenagers. They moved in and out of their relatives' houses, and at some point things looked like they would be better. Their father was fighting his addiction. However, it was false hope. He returned to drinking, and this time he abandoned his daughters entirely. The girls had to stay with relatives full-time, but they were not about to be dependent on them, and since their father didn't leave them with anything, they found work. And they got a crappy one, but it allowed them to have small cash at hand. 
The two of them were soda bottle hunters and had to combine this with their education, but they wouldn't be so for too long. Betty had an idea. She suggested that the two of them audition for radio, and they did. They both aced the audition and began to earn $20 each from their radio job. They were still in school and had to combine both schoolwork and their singing job. The radio gig was a breakthrough for the sisters, and it opened other doors for them. They sang in their high school, sang at their grandfather's rallies when he was the local mayor, and sang on TV. And as a result, they met Barney Rapp, who introduced them to his band. Working for Barney allowed them to sing at reputable clubs, leading them to their most significant breakthrough yet. Barney allowed the sisters to connect with other bands, and soon they got one of the biggest in the area, Tony Pastor's band. The sisters auditioned for the band, and they got in. Their weekly income shot to $125 a week. They had to travel with Tony to where they would perform, but needed a chaperone. Their mum's brother, George Guilfoyle, took up the responsibility, and he was the best the girls could have hoped for. George was a no-nonsense man who ensured his nieces weren't involved in any scandal. The band members only saw them when they were on the bus or performing on stage. Rosemary began to stand out, and soon she got the opportunity for a solo recording with the band. However, the singer messed it up. Surprisingly, her mess-up turned out to be what she needed. Clooney had a bad case of stage fright, and she sang the song I'm Sorry I Didn't Say Sorry When I Made You Cry Last Night in a whispery voice. Her voice thrilled listeners, and they couldn't get enough of the song. But her newfound success would soon turn sour. She and Betty had a situation. While the whole singing was Betty's idea, she couldn't cope with the constant travelling. After three years with the Tony Pastor band, Betty was exhausted. She wanted to return home, and was ready to sacrifice her pay for stability. While Betty returned home, Rosemary stayed with the band for a year, until an industry leader came knocking. Columbia Records tapped Rosemary up. Their execs believed she had a strong, rich voice, and they gave her a contract. It wasn't going to be easy. As talented as she was, Clooney wasn't the only singer on Columbia's books. But she managed to stand out from her first song, Beautiful Brown Eyes. The record was a great hit, and it sold 400,000 copies, but her success with this song was little compared to one she would have with Come On A My House in 1951. That song made her a force, and she absolutely hated it. Did you know that the actress didn't almost sing it? Armenian-American author William Sorian had written the song ten years before, and Columbia's exec believed that Clooney was the best singer on their books to sing it. According to them, Clooney had the spunk to sing that song, so when she refused, they threatened to give her the sack. Things began to escalate until Mitch Miller, a Columbia rep, intervened. He convinced the singer to sing the song, and she accepted, but she had a condition. The studio wanted her to sing the song using an Armenian accent, but Clooney said she would only sing it in an Italian accent. Well, she wasn't stubborn. She just couldn't do an Armenian accent. The only accent she could do was Italian. The songstress did her thing on the song, and it would become one of her greatest hits. Sure, she felt she didn't need the gimmick of an accent before singing, but she was under contract, and then stars couldn't truly resist. We are sure some of her reluctance would disappear when she got $130,000 as her first royalty check for the song. Rosemary had finally blossomed but to maintain fame had its thorns, as she would come to find out. The singer sang with Marlena Dietrich several times on Faye Emerson's Wonderful Town series, which aired on CBS. She never forgot her origins and continued to make guest appearances singing on the radio, on the Arthur Godfrey radio show Lipton Sponsored. It was fun, as she sometimes sang her hits, and other times she would duet with the ukulele player Arthur. As a popular singer, her pathway was clear. To become an actress and make a switch to Hollywood, it was the musical era, and studios wanted to work with the best. So it was expected when she got the lead role as Bing Crosby's romantic partner in the musical White Christmas. The pair had vocal chemistry, but there was a problem. Clooney couldn't dance to save her life. But a chance for Clooney and Crosby on Love Song Duet... It was too juicy for the studio to ignore, so they found a way to make it work. The solution was easy. No, it wasn't a body double. They just didn't let the female singer dance.
They skillfully ensured that the actress would only dance twice throughout the whole film, and it was a simple dance that wouldn't stress her. She wasn't the only one that had limitations on set. Her co-star, Vera Ellen, could dance a jig, but she couldn't sing at all. The studio hired Trudy Stevens to sing the songs, and Vera just mouthed it on screen. But Clooney wasn't comfortable with her inability to dance. She began to get more roles and found her limitation in dance annoying. So she began to take dancing lessons from professional dancer Dante Di Paola. And lessons weren't the only thing she took. She took his heart too, and he also danced into hers. Rumours said the two fell utterly head over heels for each other, and they dated. As Di Paola fondly called her, Rosella felt bliss with her lover. But it wasn't to be. The two were top professionals in their respective fields, and it came with choking work demands. De Paola went to work on a film while he was away, and Jose Ferrer and Clooney met. Their romance was red-hot, and it led to marriage in 1953. De Paola discovered that his Rosella had married, and his heart broke into a million pieces. It wouldn't be his heart that would break. Rosemary's marriage to Ferrer was not as red-hot as their romance, and honestly she could have known it had a strong possibility of failing. Why? Because the same thing that led Ferrer to Clooney was the same thing that led him to other women. The man just couldn't take his eyes off women. Once he met someone that caught his interest, he tried to bed them. When he met Rosemary, he married Phyllis Hall, his second wife, and divorced her to marry Clooney. His marriage to Ferrer followed the same path of infidelity, and he wasn't even so careful about it. The man didn't even let the marriage cool for a year before he started messing around with other women. The singer and actress claimed she heard him on the phone, bragging to his friends about the women he slept with. Rosella was shocked. She confronted her husband, but it did nothing to change his ways. The two had five children together, but in 1961 they divorced. The infidelity was just too much for the actress to bear. So as their divorce was going on, she stepped out. The actress had a steamy hot romance with Nelson Riddle, who was a band leader and a composer, but her relationship with the man showed how poor she was in picking a partner. Well, a person can't have it all, and clearly dancing wasn't only Rosemary's limitation. Riddle was married to another woman then, and he had six children, so while Clooney was giving her husband the stick for cheating on her, she was helping another man cheat on his wife. Hollywood romances are just weird, but the actress was serious about Riddle and somehow hoped things would work out between them. She and the man had a house they lived which Riddle's secretary got for them, and they may have gone longer if it wasn't for Frank Sinatra. Frank was the actress's friend, and he told her point-blank that it wouldn't work. The actress revealed that Frank told her that with her five kids and Nelson's six, how would they make it work? Also, he told her that Nelson wouldn't get a divorce. Rosemary broke it off with Nelson and he returned to his wife. But he did divorce her and marry his secretary in the end. Yes, the same secretary that got him and Rosemary the house they stayed in. The actress also remarried Jose Ferrer, but the issue was he hadn't changed. The actress caught him with Stella McGee and divorced him a second time. Jose went on to marry Stella, while Rosemary, her life almost got ruined. It caught up with her. With her career, kids and Jose, the actress couldn't cope. She was stressed, and her solution was prescription drugs, cigarettes and alcohol. This was the recipe for her doom. She got addicted to all of them and began to spiral out of control. The calm woman became erratic, and her career became secondary to her addiction. Rosella went from being the woman everyone wanted to work with to people pulling away from her because she became unreliable. It got even worse when she began to lose her voice. However, she didn't think she needed help while everything around her burned away. It took another tragedy for her to realise she was far gone slowly. Being an active supporter of Robert Kennedy, the actress went with him to his every rally and she was there, a few feet from him, when he was shot at the Ambassador Hotel. Seeing Kennedy go down in front of her unleashed all that was within her, and she went off, screaming, wailing, and completely unhinged. She never recovered, and in the few shows she went to she screamed at her audience. It became clear that she needed help, so she got it and got diagnosed with addiction and bipolar disorder. She struggled and fought her way back, but her career was gone. She had to start from the beginning. 
The actress began to sing at smaller venues, and her sister died as her luck began to turn. It was a terrible tragedy, but the singer forged ahead. She appeared on the Merv Griffin show, and she made a comeback when Bing Crosby, her old friend, invited her to join the 50th anniversary tour, where they sang on a slow boat to China. Her star burned brighter, and she began experimenting with tunes, turning out a jazz album that surprisingly did well. Then love, true love, came for her. Her old flame de Paula and her rekindled their romance. Like her, he and his dancer wife divorced. Their relationship was wholesome, but the two didn't get married until after they had spent 24 years together as partners. The actress had everything she needed, but her smoking habit came back to haunt her. She had lung cancer. The singer was treated for it, but the disease would eventually claim her life. She lived a rough life and found peace before death took her away. Join us as we unravel the extraordinary journey of Marie Blanchard, a beacon of resilience who defied the odds and transformed her life from paralysis to mesmerising the world of circus performance.